Support for LAist comes from Brantwood, a new residence in Pasadena's Playhouse Village with one- and two-bedroom apartment homes for active adults 65 and older, featuring concierge service and curated outings to museums and plays. Info at brantwood.com. It's Eric Galindo. I co-host Wild from LA Studios. This season on the show, you're going to hear a fictional Southeast LA rom-com, a love story for your ears. Catch Wild Season 2, I Think I'm Falling in Love, Listen wherever you get your podcasts. LAS Studios. Things haven't been very stable with the LA City Council leadership lately. In the past few years, there's been corruption scandals, city leaders caught on tape using racist language, and the latest. Council member Kern Price has been charged with embezzlement of public funds. Price, who has served on the city council since 2013, is an entrepreneur turned politician from LA. He's led several policy efforts for the city, including a universal income pilot program that we reported on this podcast in May. His council district nine in South LA is predominantly Latino, but that seat has been occupied by black leaders for decades. Now, the charges against Price could rattle the city council once again. This is How to LA, the podcast that helps you understand your city better. I'm your host, Brian De Los Santos. So it seems like the messiness of the LA city council continues, but this story is about more than just one political leader's charges. It also involves community's engagement and trust. To better understand where we are with Price's case, I hit up Frank Stoltz, the civics and democracy correspondent for LAist. He's been covering this case since the charges were announced. Hey, Frank. Hey, Brian. All right. So I know Price's public corruption charges were brought on about two weeks ago. Where are we right now in the process? Well, everything's sort of on hold. It's very different than in the past when uh, there was kind of a a immediate move to suspend people, council members who had been charged or indicted with crimes. Uh, The motion to suspend in this case has been referred to the Rules Committee. Uh, The Rules Committee has delayed any action until the next meeting after the summer recess in August. Uh, Meantime, uh, Price is going to be arraigned in Superior Court in mid-July. Price, uh, we should note, has said he is innocent and will defend himself. Uh, and he has pled with the city council not to suspend him. So what exactly are the charges that Price is facing? So prosecutors say that he uh, voted on a couple of development projects uh, where his wife was working for those developers, was you know making money from those developers, and that he didn't disclose that on his financial disclosure forms. Uh, and uh, presumably they're arguing that he should have recused himself from those votes. They're also claiming that he got city health benefits for his wife when his wife uh, really wasn't his wife legally because he was still married to somebody else. So that's sort of the embezzlement of funds charge. Well, that's a little bit complicated, Frank. That is a little complicated. (laughs) And so and because we don't know know more from the D.A. at this point in time, it's hard to tell you know, how how uh, how much the charges are going to hold up. So when the news happened, we actually went out and spoke to a couple of residents in CD9 at a park. And one person says she's not surprised her representative got caught with fraud. She also says she doesn't see the investment in her community needs, which for her, it's safety. But recently, some community leaders in Council District 9 spoke up in support of Price. You talked to some of them. And what did they tell you? Yeah, there were about 50 people that showed up to the corner of Avalon and 76th in the heart of the 9th City Council District that Price represents. Uh, One of them was Noreen McClendon. Uh, She's with Concerned Citizens of South Central L.A. The person is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. So my question again is, why are we rushing Mm. to remove him and remove a voting elected member representative of this council district. 
And Brian, we heard that over and over again, you know, presumed innocent until proven guilty. Uh, But we also heard people say, hey, uh, he's been a good council member for the district. Dr. Jerry Abraham is a private practitioner in the 9th District. He's also president-elect of the L.A. County Medical Association. There's no one more committed to our community's health, to our community's education, to our community's economic empowerment than Kern Price. Now is not the time to take away our voice, to take away our leadership, to make sure that our city has someone fighting for CD9 and South Los Angeles that continues to be forgotten. And then uh, the next day, there was the Rules Committee meeting, and dozens and dozens of people showed up to support Price. Uh, A lot of people called him a bridge builder between black and brown residents. Uh, His district is nearly 80 percent Latino. He is black, I should point out. And one of the people who showed up was Reverend Marvin McKinsey of the Walker Temple AME Church in the 9th District. Because of the works of Mr. Price, my church now is able to feed hundreds of people per week. Because of the works of Mr. Price, we are now able to provide counseling and social services to those in need. Because of the works of Mr. Price, we can provide drug and alcohol rehabilitation. So uh, I should play one more soundbite because uh, there were a couple of people who spoke out against Price. Uh, One of them was Clemente Franco. We're losing South Central LA. We're losing it to developers. We're losing it to investors. And this council person has been complicit in that. So those who really didn't like him in the first place are happy to see him suspended. Uh, But the vast majority of people are saying, uh, or at least who are speaking up, are saying, hey, you know, uh, don't remove our council person. Don't remove our voting member of the council. It's kind of a huge deal for a city leader that's facing these charges to get this kind of support, right? Yeah, uh, we didn't really see this with Jose Wiesar and Mark Ridley Thomas, both of whom were, like I mentioned earlier, almost immediately suspended. Uh, They did end up uh, getting convicted, uh, but there wasn't this sort of outpouring of support, although Mark Ridley Thomas did get it uh, a little later on around his trial. Uh, But this sort of immediate uh, group of folks coming out, supporting the council person. Now, it's hard to tell how much of it is organic and how much of it is sort of orchestrated by the councilman's office. But nonetheless, you know, there are many, many people who are willing to stand up and say, you know, at least keep him on the council until he's convicted of anything. And, you know, this is a big deal because in those other two cases I mentioned, uh, after they were suspended, uh, there was no voting member to represent those council districts. And, and it stayed that way for months on end. Uh, and, and that's the argument people made around Price is like, you're, it's essentially voter suppression uh, if you suspend him. And what about the other city leaders on the council? What have they said about the charges? Well, that's really interesting. When the charges first came out, council member Katie Yaroslavsky said she was tired of council people getting charged with crimes. But she was also willing to let the process play out. Uh, council member Tim McCosker initially said he would vote to suspend Price. Uh, but then he shows up at the Rules Committee meeting last week saying how impressed he was by the support being offered Price, kind of backing off his initial position. So right. the, the council, again, is acting very differently than has acted in these previous cases. Uh, and in fact, President Paul Krikorian, uh, who sits on the Rules Committee, said outright that the council moved too quickly in the previous cases and that the DA has not, in his words, presented one iota of evidence against Price. But uh, then again, I should point out that's not uncommon in these state cases. That's another difference in this case. This is a case being prosecuted by the district attorney, not the federal government. And prosecutors uh, in in state cases typically don't present a lot of evidence until a preliminary hearing. That's in contrast to federal indictments that include a lot of information about the crimes and the reasoning behind the charges. So let's see what happens next. Uh, Let's say that they choose or vote not to suspend him. He's still on city council. He comes back into the meetings, and then there's these charges that are playing along. What's kind of next? I mean, do we just wait until there's a case? 
Yeah, essentially. Or he he cuts a deal with prosecutors. Um, the next step is an arraignment in mid-July. Then there'll be a date for a preliminary hearing and the initial evidence will come out and then, you know, uh, a trial date. And so this could extend out, you know, for many, many, many months. And then he could just go back and do his job as a city councilman if they don't suspend him. And uh, so there'll be a you know, a guy who'll continue to do his job as he fights criminal charges. Frank, thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. We'll dive into talking about how much this impacts L.A. politics at large after this break. Support for LAist comes from Brantwood with one- and two-bedroom apartment homes in Pasadena's Playhouse Village for active adults 65 and older. Featuring a central courtyard, rooftop garden, a grand lounge, library, and bar, Brantwood is designed to sustain a safe and caring community surrounded by the dynamism of downtown living with curated experiences and trips to museums, concerts, and plays. Featuring concierge service, security, medical care partnerships, and fitness programs. Learn more and join the interest list at Brantwood.com. Hey everyone, I'm Rima Hreis, host of This Is Uncomfortable, a podcast from Marketplace. This season, we explore how secrets can shape our financial lives. We've got stories about the creative lengths people go to pay off student debt, what it's like to become addicted to financial submission, and how easy it can be to get stuck in a vicious cycle. We take a look at how secrets take a toll on our lives and what price some are willing to pay for the truth. Listen to This Is Uncomfortable wherever you get your podcasts. We're back. You're listening to How to LA from LA Studios. When we were looking to cover the story, we wanted to bring you context of why this story matters. It's not just about one district or one politician. It's also about the makeup of LA politics and the possibility of a shift. Erica Smith, a columnist for the LA Times, wrote about what this moment could mean for LA's Black political power. She tackled this question in her article. Are prices charges another blow for Black power in LA? I'm curious to know, as you speak with community members, maybe, or other leaders, or even people in your newsroom, when it comes to, like, city leadership and and how this drama is playing out, what are, what are you seeing? You know, it, it's all over the map. I've had a lot of calls people asking me, is there, like, a conspiracy out to, to take out Black politicians, which I, I guess I'm not surprised that that is a, a question, but it is by and large the question that I've gotten the most from people. And, of course, that factors into with, you know, the shrinking population of Black residents, in part because people are being priced out. And it's interesting, too, because I don't think that a lot of people, at least in my experience in talking to them, a lot of people, you know, think it's federal prosecution, again, the same person that was behind Mark Early Thomas's indictment. But, you know, this is a county level. This is George Gascon. Um, and so a lot of people are surprised about that. A lot of people don't really know a lot of the details about the case. I think We've had so many scandals in the city over the last few years that people lump them all together. Part of that, I think, is probably the media writ large's fault that we kind of list all these things together. But I do think in the public mind and frankly, probably in a lot of our minds as journalists, I mean, it is just kind of like always political drama at City Hall. And so it does seem like one more thing that we have to worry about just when we think we don't have to worry about anything else. What's also interesting about this story is that Community leaders in his District 9 came out in support to, you know, share messages of why they shouldn't move forward of, you know, suspending him from the council just yet. They also made a point that he was elected into power and so he should be um, working in his office until whatever comes down from those charges. Obviously, people have come out against him. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really interesting to see this moment. The council delayed the vote to suspend him, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And not to rush the process like they did for other politicians. That's kind of interesting, no? I mean, I'm kind of in the mindset that the council, you know, really watched what happened with Mark Ridley Thomas. And just as, you know, as a refresher, he was indicted. He was suspended by the council fairly quickly. His, His pay was suspended as well, which set off this, you know, not only a legal battle from Ridley Thomas to try to get his pay reinstated, but also from outside rights groups and advocates who supported him. Um, that we saw a you know a back and forth of 
when he was suspended, there was a non-voting member. And then there was, you know, yeah, former council president Herb Wesson was brought back. Um, there was the drama of the lawsuit of him being termed out and whether he could actually serve the city council appointing him despite those, I think unwisely appointing him despite those obvious issues. And then lo and behold, if you, you know, a little while later, we find out that Wesson can't serve. And so we're back to this like non-voting member. And then they appoint uh, a voting member who is council member Heather Hutt. And there's drama over that. So like basically the, the constituents in that district went through like having a voting member, not having a voting member, having a voting member, not having a voting member, not knowing who the person is, not agreeing with, you know. And so I think that the members of the council saw that drama play out and, and saw kind of the embarrassment, particularly when they had to, for example, pay you know reinstate his pay and pay him back wages and i'm talking to really thomas here and so i don't think anybody really wanted to repeat that trauma in council district nine i mean it's it's worth noting as well that you know current prices district um uh, council district nine near the 110 freeway is one of the poorest in the city and so i don't think anybody on the council wants to be seen as disenfranchising some of the poorest people in the city particularly people of color um, the district is majority Latino. I think also a big part of the story, which is why I reached out to you, you wrote about this in your column about LA's black political power. You know, there aren't many council members who are black. We do have a black mayor, but you know, if Price has to step down, it's it's said that maybe a Latina a Latino would replace him because of the makeup of his district. But I kind of want to ask you, how important is it for a black leader to represent this district that has been historically represented by a black leader for decades now? I mean, I honestly think, and I'm, and I'm not trying to be evasive, but I honestly think it depends on who you ask. I mean, I do think there is a large segment of the city as population, particularly black population, who, you know, frankly, has grown up, has always known kind of what we refer to as like, you know, tribal politics, which is you know, we want to have, you know, I mean, and, and representation is important and I don't want to downplay that, but I do think there's this sense of if we lose people who are black in office, we as black people will not be represented. And and there are lots of reasons to believe that. And, and all, and, and a lot of them happen to be true. A lot of them may, may not be as true as they once were, but I do think there's another generation of people who, you know, don't hold as fast maybe to that tribal identity politics, um, maybe in part because they came of age at a time when the city didn't have, particularly I'm talking Black people here, um, didn't have as many Black residents. And so, you know, looking at it through, you know, purely through that lens, I mean, you know that, you know, there's only amount, only a certain amount of time for this to, to happen. If you look at only Black people can represent Black interests, you know, if you plan on living here for several more decades, you're, you know, you're probably just not going to have that, or you're just going to be living in one district, if that's what you honestly, genuinely believe. Um, and so I think that, you know, having somebody, you know, having three Black council members, having, you know, a, a council member in that district that current price represents, I mean, to a lot of people, it's very important. I mean, we have to remember, too, that that district is one that has voted for a Black council person, you know, for decades. Um, but there was also, you know, a wide anticipation that whenever current Price left office and he's he's you know, scheduled to be termed out in 2026, that the Latina and a Latino, as you mentioned, or a Latino, as you mentioned, might probably take that seat. So the notion, I think that people already expected that to happen. I mean, I think there was some planning for that. We saw that to an extent during the redistricting fight, um, which came up to an extent was hinted at in some of those racist audio leak tapes where you had this fight between um, council member Marquise Harris Dawson, who represents council district eight and current price who represents council district nine about who gets USC, like wh what side of the, the boundaries that go on and the argument from Harris Dawson's camp and a lot of the people he had appointed uh, to the redistricting commission was that, you know, eventually Marquise's district is going to be the only one that's going to have the majority of Black people in it with a Black council member. So we want to have that asset for the Black community. That was generally the basis of the argument. So the, the expectation was already that Price's district would eventually go to somebody who's Latino. So I don't know. I, I think it's, it's, it's important, but I think we also have to remember that like a large swath of the Black community had already resigned itself that District 9 was not going to be led by a Black representative in the fairly near future. And you know, it's just also interesting that there was this committee with scholars out there that issued a report to city leadership on how to keep City Hall away from corruption, you know? And yeah. their advice included expanding city council to 25 seats, a more expansive ethics commission, independent redistricting. 
What would you add to this list if you could, you know, give advice? I think it's, first of all, I just want to say, I think it's important that they're doing this work. I mean, we only have 15 council members, you know, which has been the way since like, I think the 1920s, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I always, when I figured out how many council members we had and how many you know people that they represent, which is, you know, in the hundreds of thousands, I, I think about where I grew up in Cleveland, which is like, you know, way smaller and is shrinking. And that city has 17 council members and each person only represents about 25,000 people. So like, I mean, the fact that the numbers are so similar council to council is like, is just wild to me. And, and it's, so it's not surprising that we have one of the smallest city councils of any major city in the country. Uh, and that, just on its face just needs to change. Um, You know, I think the importance is more about, you know, how we go about picking this independent commission. And I guess if I had to, once I give advice, but that would be my point of concern about how we go about doing this, because the whole goal is to really get a mix of people and draw these districts in a way that has some sort of public trust. And I think that from what I understand, one of the goals of this is to kind of reduce this tribalism in politics, right? So you don't have the Latino district, the Black district, the API district, the white people district, whatever. I mean, that we have a mix of people. And so you, the, those groups in those districts in the city elect people who can represent more constituents as a whole, as opposed to potentially catering to one group. And I, you know, I, I do think that will foster some, tr- you know, some trust in the system. Erica Smith is a columnist at the LA Times. Thanks for chatting with me, Erica. Thanks for having me on. Frank Stoltz and the team at LAist will be covering what happens next with prices charges. Follow the latest on LAist.com. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you understood a little bit more about what's happening in CD9. Tomorrow, we're headed to Inglewood to eat. Yes, LA is food editor Gop Chabron and I will be sampling some of the restaurants there. Be sure to check that out. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, share with a friend, a coworker, your boo. Every bit helps. See you later, LA. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. Pa, te presento a mi novia Luna. Hola, mucho gusto. Eric Galindo, co-host of Wild here, and this season, I'm going to tell you a fictional love story. The type of story that feels like a movie. It was inspired by my life. The woman I was dating, off and on again for a minute, comes to me and says she wants to move to Milwaukee. You're looking at the newest anchor for YWCC News, baby! I'm going to be the face of Milwaukee's leading news source. It was a road trip adventure across America. I was steeped in love and in one of the most confusing relationships of my life. This is a Southeast LA rom-com. It's the kind of fictional audio drama that forces you to confront parts of yourself. From Alias Studios, listen to Wild Season 2, I Think I'm Falling in Love. Catch the new season on NPR One, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts.